very good afternoon and i welcome you all for the parallel technical session number 16 hall d uh, i have the pleasure of inviting uh, the chair for the session engineer srinivas mantrala from afghans infrastructure limited and also i welcome co chair professor jairajan p from nit calicut and in this session we have a soap lecture by mizanur rehman from the university of south australia and followed by other presentations will be there in this session five presentations will be there in this session now after this uh, soap lecture now uh, on behalf of the organizing committee i welcome srinivas mantralaya mantrala and uh, srinivas mantrala is the vice president of afghans and he is a graduate in civil engineering from nit warangal and post graduate in marine geotechnical engineering from iit madras and currently is pursuing phd from iit madras i believe uh, i extend a hearty welcome to you sir uh, on behalf of the organizing committee and request you to chair this technical session thank you i also welcome professor jairajan p from nit calicut uh, professor jairaj he is professor at uh, nit calicut and his area of research is is in soil dynamics dynamic soil structure interaction and performance based earthquake engineering on behalf of the organizing committee i extend a hearty welcome to you sir and request you to co chair this session thanks a lot sir now it is over to the chair and the co chair to carry forward this session please sir over to you good afternoon everybody and particularly professor mizanu rahman and uh, liquefaction is a very important phenomena to be taken care during earthquakes and i'm sure most of you must have come across with a recent uh, whatsapp message showing the liquefaction happening in some parts of assam where there was a recent earthquake you know it's uh, talking and listening is something different than seeing with our own eyes the ground was virtually moving and the people are really afraid of standing on the you know ground getting liquefied this practically held because of the grass on the tops layer it is on the ground but nevertheless in india all along the boundary with himalayas that area is prone for seismic activity because of the geomorphology at the same time we are having our uh, you know indo ganges plains are there all along this boundary and this area is prone for all the structures are prone for you know liquefaction given this background and uh, the study of liquefaction is very apt for this conference and i thank the organizers to give me the assignment to be chair of the session i am extremely grateful to them and now i take the privilege to introduce professor rahman he is professor rahman did his phd from university of new south wales in the year 2010 and for his extraordinary work his work has been given gold medal which is a rare thing and in a short span of 10 years from his phd he rose to the position of associate professor and heading three academics and he is guiding today 10 phd students more important is like being i came from i come from industry he is working in the area of transferring the theoretical knowledge into actual engineering applications in the field 
I'm sure it has a lot of value. And that can be seen from the very fact that he is having projects worth $2.3 million. You know, he is guiding, you know, which transfer into actual execution on the field. And I'm sure his CV is going to be, or he will be a role model for all the PhD scholars to put in active work and emulate him and rise quickly in the career. Now, I would request Professor Rahman to take over and uh, share his knowledge with all of us. Dr. Rahman, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Srinivas. Um, it's a big uh, introduction <laughs> for me. Um, okay, I'll share my presentation and then I'll talk, start talking about um, what I'm working about nearly 15 years. So, um, and I'm hoping that uh, most of the people would have access to my paper. So the presentation would link with that. So the topic of my presentation is equivalent state theory of seal descent. And I'm pretty sure probably you haven't heard about this theory yet because it's just uh, uh, starting. The work I'll be presenting, it's um, 16 years of work with many renowned colleagues and I need to acknowledge them, uh, like uh, Professor Robert Lowe from University of New South Wales, Professor Yanis Dafalias from University of California, Davis, Professor Mishko Chibroniski at University of Canterbury Crashers, Professor T.Z. Sitaram, Institute of Technology, Guwahati, late Professor Tom Shans and Mizam Gadarji from Ruhr University, Bukam, and uh, Antonio Carrario Imperial College. I would also like to acknowledge uh, many of my former and current PhD students, uh, particularly Dr. Abdul Baki, Dr. Koi Nguyen, and Dr. Nick Barnett. And um, for this kind of research, we haven't got industry funding, but it was supported by federal and state governments funding. So these are the content of my presentation. First, I will talk about what is sandwich fines. It's probably a new to most of you. It's particularly uh, we can say loosely silty soil, but it has a very specific explanation. So I'll talk about that. Then I will talk about the problem with sandwich fines. Um, when Professor Sibanar was, was talking about soil liquefaction, um, you may remember like uh, soil liquefaction in pressures, New Zealand in 2019 and 2014, I was there and I have firsthand experience on soil liquefaction. And it's particularly problem for sandwich fines. Then I will introduce some density concept, concept like void ratio, then equivalent density concept E star. From there, I will go to equivalent state and fee of its application, particularly critical state and critical state line and critical state soil making framework. Then I will give you an example of soil liquefaction assessment for Ahmedabad sandy soil. I just picked this example so that uh, people from India would be interested in it. Then I will talk about how can we implement this concept in few constitutive models, including cyclic uh, constitutive models. First, um, <clears throat> over here in this work, we define sand, any particle size bigger than 0 0.075 millimeter to 2.36 millimeter. But most importantly, smaller than that is fines. And most of the fines in this talk would be non or low plastic fines. So in this figure, we have uh, the right axis, uh, the particle axis is percentage final, and uh, x axis is particle size. This is uh, 0 0.075 millimeter size. This is a clean sand, green size distribution. Uh, this is uh, uniformly graded sand, and this is fine green size distribution. Over here, we systematically increase fine content in the sand. So if we increase fine content, this is 10%, 15%, 20%, and 30%. So if we go 100% fine, it would be silty soil, silt. Uh, if we go 0% uh, fine, it would be clean sand. So we could look at the transitional behavior. Now, what is the problem with that? So if you have a soil sand with 10% fine, and if you treat it as a single soil, then we do not have any problem. We'll do the test, we'll understand the soil behavior, and we can implement this understanding in our design. 
But in reality, what happened, a single soil may be mixed with different percentages of mines. Then the single problem doesn't work. So people from the very beginning try to develop a single framework. And when you try to do that, you have lots of problems. So I uh, present some of the example over here. For example, Question and Shang, they use medium sand and use non-plastic silt increase from zero to 60%. What they observe with uh, void ratio, with same void ratio, the strength um, decreases or liquefaction resistance decreases. They didn't compare with the relative density, so we will not talk about that. But again, if they change the medium sense to find sand and use the same silt from zero to 60%, they observe something interesting. The strength increase up to 5% then decrease. There is some other example, even if you look at the Ottawa sand, three of them over here, uh, for example, carol fine, the strength increases up to 5% then decrease. The others they they find is always decreasing. So if we have a consistent trend of decreasing, then we could add a reduction factor or uh, with the clean sand, then we could use in design. But in this case, it's not the case. So the comparison basis, whether we are using relative density or wide ratio, is not consistent over here. So for this particular type of soil, we I need to or, or I like to start with the basic concepts. So over here in this figure, um, I have a schematic diagram of sand particles. Uh, these are the sand particles randomly distributed and in between we have void space, maybe filled with water. So the void ratio of this particular arrangement would be volume of void divided by volume of solid. So for this arrangement, the void ratio is constant at the moment. With the fabric, if we change the orientation of the particle, it might change, but Let's do not talk about fabric at this moment, but for this arrangement, this is the void ratio. So for this void ratio, we have particle contact points. When you apply load in this soil, the load would be transferred through the contact point. So what does it mean? This void ratio represents the skeleton structure of the soil, that is its resistance capacity. But in this soil, if I somehow manipulate these and add some fine content in between the voids. These, these fine content are not contributing to the skeleton structure. They are not taking any force. But what they are doing, they're increasing the solid content in the void ratio calculation, decreasing the volume of void in the calculation. So their void ratio is decreasing. So what we would expect, the void ratio of clean sand would be higher than void ratio of sand with fines, but the same skeleton structure. But they might have the same resistance because if we applied in this soil some load, then they would be transferred through the same skeleton structure. So these are the inconsistency we are observing. So one example you can see over here, these data come from Maliki. They use um, clean bubbles or sand and sand with 10% fine. Here is their uh, triaxial test data. Y axis is deputric stress and X axis is axial strain. So, what do we see? Both sand with 10% fine or sealed or clean sand has the same behavior, same, same strength, peak strength, but their void ratio is different. 10% sealed is smaller than clean sand. And ideally, if we look at it, the same soil, then lower void ratio means higher skeleton structure, more density of contact, higher strength. This is not we see over here. So void ratio is not consistent. Let's see another example over here. Um, uh, this is from Corbis, uh, who first used the equivalent void ratio concept. That's why I picked this figure over here. This is triaxial test data for band mine tailings and cam loop sales. So what they have done, they increased the seal content 4%, 0%, 4%, 7.5%, 13.3, and 22.3%. The compression side and extension size behavior are almost same, except in our compression size, a little bit different in higher fine content. So what happened over here, as we increase the fine content, as you see, the void ratio is decreasing, but more or less their behavior remains same. So this void ratio, the global void ratio is not representing their skeleton structure, not representing their strength. So what they have done for the first time, they're considering this void over here, uh, this fine particle over here as void. 
based on that, they are calculating a skeleton void ratio equivalent to clean sand void ratio. When you do that, then we can see the void ratio become consistent, except with two higher fine content. Okay, let's move further, see what happened. If we understand that if void ratio, we need to uh, modify it to equivalent granular void ratio, uh, then we come up with some equations. So Tebana Yagam first introduced this equation to modify these void, global void ratio to equivalent granular void ratio. For this particular case, he's assuming all the fines over here are not contributing to the solid skeleton structure, not contributing to the strength. So they can consider this fine as a void. This equation you might see in many different form, but this is a simplistic uh, with some assumptions. So over here, um, if we assume everything is fine and not contributing, then you can transport them to uh, equivalent granular virus this way. But over here, if fine content is higher, then some of the fine may come in between the contact, between coarse grain, and they will contribute to the strain. So in this case, we have to consider them. So he modified or they modified, their team modified this equation this way, where B, B represent the active fines, that is the red small fine particle over here, the fraction of active fine. These two uh, formulation is uh, uh, internally compatible. For example, if we assume no fines are active, then B equal to zero, then this equation transferred to that equation. That equation is actually this. If there is no fine content in the sand skeleton structure, Fc equal to zero, then the void ratio, equivalent granular void ratio become the void ratio of clean sand. So this is nice and compatible. But the problem is how do you get the B for active fines? We cannot see grain to grain contact. So how can we get it? So what do we have to do? We have to find um, some test data and try to find out uh, what would be the equivalence. I will not talk about this today, but I will show you uh, the history of the development. So when first Thevanagiyagam presented this uh, E star equation with B, he assumed about one quarter of fine would be active. So B equal to 0.25, and it's constant. It doesn't, uh, doesn't vary with fines content. But later uh, they publish another paper as a reply they said that B for different sand with fines varies with uniformity coefficient of sand with fines and diameter ratio. <clears throat> in 2004, uh, Ni proposed that actually this B depends on the particle size, the xi. D10 is the 10% finer of clean sand and small d50 is 50% finer size for fine size. In 2008, during my PhD, I realized it must be related to uh, particle size and also the fine content. If fine fits in the gap between the coarse particle, then if the fine content is significantly enough, then they, will, they must come in between the coarse. So based on that, with some uh, growth theory, we come up with semi-empirical equation like this. In this equation, we had two fitting parameter M and N. And then another later paper we publish um, for nine different data set, we could just assume n equal to one and m equal to 0.3, and that satisfy a wide range of data. Another equation published in 2014 by Lashkri with like this, this is also empirical equation with um, another parameter is roundness ratio. So he has fine content and the diameter ratio. Right? Mohammed and Kwadami is actually, uh, reanalyze our data, uh, our, my equation, and suggested it could be simplified this way. Chen and Deng the propose another equation. It's come from a slightly different theory, so it's a very interesting one. With DEM analysis, discrete element model analysis, there is other theories coming, so uh, I'm not discussing over here because they are much more complicated. Now, whatever the equation for B we use from here, um, it's not the important thing over here. The important thing, if we get an appropriate E star equivalent granular void ratio, then whether we can further go ahead with some theory development. I have used lots of uh, data from literature, mostly using the equation over here. For example, uh, some list in the paper, 
uh, for different types of behavior. We use that equation and it works. Now, when we look at the B and uh, how uh, B would be varying with particle size and fine content back in, in 2005 or seven or six, uh, one particular paper helped a lot. That's McGree in 1961 from Journal of American Ceramic Society. They have big particle then mixed with smaller particle. As you see, as you increase the fine particles, uh, then the uh, bigger particle disappear in it. That developed the understanding and the mathematical formulation. But now with my student, we do 3D DEM simulation. Over here, we get 0% uh, fine that's been clean sand. Uh, about 10 and uh, 10 and a half thousand particles. This one 5% fine about uh, 66,000 particle. And then we have 10% fine about 130,000 particles. So as you see, we increase a number of uh, percentage of fine content. The problem become very, very difficult to run within a reasonable time in computer simulation. But when you do the test, we see at critical state, this clean sand develop a soil skeleton structure, force structure like that, a high density structure. And with that, you can assume uh, this soil would take higher strength. When you have 5%, despite of 66,000 particles, the skeleton structure is far less dense. From that, we expect that there would be lower strength and 10% is even, even lesser. So it tells us, um, when we increase fine content, when a natural soil has fine content, it has natural tendency of getting lower strength. So liquefaction problem is uh, worst for sand with fines. We have another parameter over here that we call um, a strong contact between fines and the ratio between a strong contact between fines and coarse particle. But this one is 0.01, that's been 1%, and this one for 3%. So as you see, as we increase fine content, that indicate the active fraction of fine, active fraction of fine is increasing. So it's uh, consistent with the theory we, we used. Now over here, we can see uh, clean sand has a higher critical state line. Sand with 10%, 5% fine is over there and 10% fine would be over there. And uh, this is QP path. This is M line, the critical state at the end of the test. Uh, so it tells us even for same void ratio of the soil, uh, sand with fine would have lower strength. Let's see a few applications. First, I will look at the critical state sand. So uh, these are the sand test data, Sydney sand with the Madura fines. Uh, this is the critical state line for clean sand. Uh, by the way, this is y axis as a void ratio, and x axis is the mean effective stress in a critical state. This is 5%, 15%, 20%, and 30%. As we increase fine content, as we expect the critical state line going down. Each of these fine and critical state framework is good enough to do further analysis. But in this case, as you see, it's not possible uh, because you have to do test for all these different fine content and develop the framework and do the analysis. And then if you realize if, uh, if you have a soil of 10% fine, you do not have the data. So what we have there done over here, this y-axis void ratio, we transport the equivalent granular void ratio. So everything merge with the clean sand data. So clean sand critical state line, basically the critical state line in equivalent space for sand with fines. When you have the critical state line, we can use the Bain and Jeffries concept to define a state parameter. A state parameter is nothing but void ratio of a soil and the void ratio on the critical state line at same P. That's mean a state parameter combine the effect of density E and P. Now, if a soil is above the critical state line, that's mean a state parameter is positive, it would be contractive and liquefiable. If a soil state is below the critical state line, it would be dilative and non liquefiable. But, but when we have fine content, then we have many lines and we must equivalent critical state line. From that concept, we can have equivalent state parameter in the same way that will combine effect of EP and fine content. Now let's see one example use of uh, uh, this theory. We use Ahmadabad sand to assess liquefaction. This is clean sand data, this is quarry dust and different percentages of fine content grain size distribution. 
these data come from Das and uh, his other works with proper CCDRAM. But when I use this data in equivalent space, this is the critical state line we gave for sand with different fine content. Now, you know, for critical state analysis, we need to estimate what would be the cyclic stress ratio we would expect from our earthquake that we can do from this analysis, simply by method from seed and idris. But in experimental setting, we do a triaxial cyclic loading test where sigma d is the magnitude of David Rick stress and sigma prime is the confining stress. As we have higher cyclic stress ratio, this magnitude would be higher and number of cycle to liquefy would be lower. So what happened in this graph, yx is the cyclic stress ratio and number of cycles. So number of cycle required to liquefaction would be lower for higher cyclic stress ratio. And for lower cyclic stress ratio, number of cycles would be higher. So we get a line, but if we change the void ratio, if we change the uh, confining stress, it would be different lines, but same train. In this figure, we have additional complexity. We have fines content. For each fine content, same global void ratio, different lines. So this is a problem. So what do we do over here? We try to estimate what would be the cyclic resistance ratio for an equivalent 20 cycles of loading. So that depends on the magnitude of earthquake and fault um, characteristics. So 20 number of cycle and respective cyclic ratio is um, cyclic resistance ratio at 20 cycles. If we get all the data and plot them in this figure, so this is cyclic resistance ratio and this is equivalent state parameter, they come to a nice strain irrespective of different fine content. Now we collected a, a uh, data from Raju who worked with Professor Sitaram. Uh, there was a SPD test in passport operation near to the Sabramati River. This is the grain size uh, soil type you can see with different fines content. And they have SPD data, it is varying like this. In conventional liquefaction analysis, we have, this is cyclic stress ratio of resistance ratio and corrected SPD count. But different number of cycle, we have different boundary curve. For example, if we have a uh, speed value, correct speed value 15, if it is here, then it's liquefiable for um, higher fine content, but for uh, liquid, not liquefiable for higher fine content, but liquefiable for 5% fine content. We can use the same concept to analyze that. So what we have done over here, this is the cyclic stress ratio and corrected local. This data we plot over here, SPT data. And this is the boundary curve come from here. What do you see? It's to the right of the curve. So they are non liquefiable. The site didn't liquefy during Bhuj earthquake. But the same analysis we could do equivalent state parameter. And this is the boundary line we get. Anything on the right side, these data points, it's mean non liquefiable. So, what is the advantage of that? This theory comes from theoretical background, whereas uh, the empirical chart, it's a developed chart that changes with new data sets. To develop the constitutive model, we need uh, uh, at least uh, four different strategies. One is elastic parameters, uh, yield surface. If it is a model for critical state, then critical state parameter, the latency of flow rule or hardening rule or higher uh, plastic modulus. So let's, say, uh, let's uh, look at the elastic parameter. How do you handle that? This is hardening equation or general classification to estimate the uh, elastic parameter. G max, this is the equation. What do we do did over here? We just replace E by E star for different fines content. And this is the major data, and this is the predicted data using clean sand equation, but replacing E by E star. It matched very well. One thing you would notice well, clean Houston sand has higher G max than 30% um, Houston sand with 30% fine content over here. But despite of that, it, it pretty well. There is other data set we analyze it and it did the same. For critical state parameter, the, uh, because all the critical state line march with the crit critical state line of clean sand, so the parameter doesn't change, it remains the same. Uh, so we just use the parameter for clean sand critical state lines. When you look at the dial latency parameter, it's a bounding surface model we are looking at. So uh, it has a function of psi all the parameter, this D and um, this should be 
stress ratio over here is missing. Um, all the parameter uh, D naught and M would be same, only we change side to side star as I explained before. The plastic modulus and hardening parameter would be the same thing over here. Everything, every parameter remains same. We just change to side to side star, G to G star, side to side star over here. And that's the model is ready. So the, what does it mean? We would have a model for a range of fine content with one set of parameters that is for clean sand. So these are the equation, key equation I put and the values from clean sand over here. Then look at the prediction. If we look at the prediction, this is diabetic stress ratio and mean effective stress path for different 15, 20 and 30% fine content. And these are the model prediction. I put two models over here. The model I explained is the first one and the second, the blue line was another model with fabric evolution. So at the beginning, I said, forget about the fabric, just focus on the word ratio. And we know that is not correct. So I avoid the complexity over there, but actually we can consider the fabric over here. In, in this figure, both of them is quite well. So why do you need fabric? So if you look at the dense cell behavior due and 15%, these are the path. Without fabric, this is the dotted line prediction. You see uh, dotted line is much more contractive. It doesn't capture the behavior, but when we have fabric, it's much more close. So fabric is needed to some extent. If we want to know cyclic loading behavior, we again choose one of the WS model for 2014. Um, this is exactly same formulation. There is little tricks. Um, uh, they, they change the yield function slightly so that they can play with uh, cyclic behavior. And they also have a constant fabric parameter. This fabric is different than the fabric evolution. Um, we check the behavior, well, just one data I didn't present uh, 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 the real prediction, just hypothetical curve over here. This is clean sand. You can see this is the clean sand behavior. This is model prediction. And this is cyclic loading behavior different. We could have positive or negative or conventional cyclic loading. But what do we see over here? A little bit deviation with these uh, real test and the monitoring test data. And when you look at the poor water pressure generation, uh, the real soil developed uh, a little bit slower, but the model predict quite fast. So these are the deviation we, we observe over here. Is the time up? Now, this is my conclusion or my understanding over here. Uh, this works very well with uniformly graded sand. It says a single type sand, a single or uh, poorly graded sand with non-plastic fine, there is no doubt. If we substitute E by E start, then we can predict G max equivalent granular state ratio, steady state line. Um, that should not be any problem. If we substitute E and E star and psi and psi star in existing constitutive model, it seems it works. There would be some discrepancies, this could be improved. But what I have shown over here, we just choose the parameter from clean sand and use it, that works. But I do not see much work on this field. Uh, there is few research, like six, seven research group working on this, but not much work report on plastic fines, not within this framework. There is some work, but not looking at uh, equivalent granular concept and well-graded sand. This framework I presented today over here, it's, we call it sand with fine section. It's not necessarily have to be fines and sand. If we have sand and fine actions, then we could use it. So we need more research on this. Thank you, any questions? Did Professor Rahman, I would like to say, first time I had the concept of uh, equivalent word ratio, how it affects, and you have very nicely explained step by step, you know, where the initially the fine particles are filling up the only voids, then letters they are in between the you know, two sand particles and how they affect, how to take care. And uh, okay. I mean, first time I'm hearing that sort of concept. Maybe we, so, uh, more than that, you have very nicely explained the implications of that. And it's a very nice presentation. And, uh, Thank you. I would request uh, Dr. Jairajan to say, uh. take it forward. Anyway, thanks a lot, Professor uh, Mizanur Rahman. A wonderful presentation. 
And uh, I think that it will be definitely a part of my very latest research. And uh, I think that if we push much more ahead, we may find something a new discovery, I think, uh, because the concept, you know, we are transforming a very complicated phenomenon into a mathematical equation. It is unimaginable, unimaginable. That's a very good kind of, and uh, I'm very sure that this will have a very, uh, what I would say, practical uh, significance or implication, at least in the process of evaluation of the liquefaction, where the percentage fines will have a very markedly influence on the, on the science. So all the best for your research. Thanks a lot for sharing your uh, wonderful, uh, you know, uh, findings uh, with uh, such a very nice audience. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you Aman, very much. Uh, yes. Very good lecture, very informative. And I also worked on critical state behavior of uh, granular media using DM simulations, which of course we know took over. Uh, then uh, I have one uh, thing. Yes. Uh, how did you yes. take this fabric into account? Uh, Briefly, you can, because this is yeah. not uh, today's scope. Yeah, um, now it's a part of that. Uh, for this particular model, it has a, okay, two things. Um, we can look at fabric in uh, uh, from DM simulation because you have the uh, fabric tensor. From that, we can play with uh, different. But for this particular model, it's actually need a fabric evaluation rule. So it is start with the initial fabric and how the fabric will change that depends on uh, for this model is plastic strain. So um, it, it, it's actually well known as ACST, um, anisotropic critical state theory. Okay. So it's um, the recent work with Professor Lee and Dafalis, and then we took over for sandwich fines. So what does it, uh, this rule is saying uh, the three condition of critical state, a constant bar ratio, constant Q and constant P is not enough to define a critical state. That should be a, a critical state fabric. So uh, fabric evolved from initial fabric to critical state fabric. And that critical state fabric can be present in terms of normalized value of one. So we have some publication on these as well. Uh, we try to evaluate that through the DEM simulation, how that uh, evolved uh, uh, during sharing. And then we compare with uh, this constitutive model because constitutive models to, uh, formulation comes from plastic theory of metals, not, not from GM simulation. So we're now trying to compare them and reduce the gap in solve. Uh, regarding this fabric, we use some anisotropic coefficients, uh, you know, PhD yes. kind of a thing. Uh, we were using that for the force signs, for uh, normal force, tangential force, and also for Fabry. Uh, we yes. were characterizing through anisotropic coefficients. As the shearing develops, the coefficients yeah. would grow. So that is what I was interested to know how actually this, that has been taken here. Thank you. Thank you. For constitutive Great. model point of view, it's a different a different way of formulation than uh, what we do in DM. Yeah. Good, sir. Excellent presentation. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for Thank giving you, me Mr. that. Thank you, Mr. Rahman. Now I would request uh, co-chair, Mr. Professor Jarajan, to organize for the other lectures. Okay, so I think uh, I think we it's the time that we go for the paper presentations. So so today I think we have five papers. So the first paper presentation I think uh, it is. Let me just go through that lines or D. Yes, we have the first presenter that is. Uh, based assessment of liquefaction potential using SPT, approach by, by Gurpreet Singh Bhatia nuclear, from Nuclear Power Corporation. So, Mr. Gurpreet, can you please come with that presentation? Good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, I am Gurpreet. I am working as an executive engineer, uh, scientific officer D in Nuclear Power Corporation of India Limited. The topic of my presentation is a reliability based assessment of liquefaction potential using SPT approach. Before starting in the presentation, I would like to tell you like what is the actual motivation to take up this topic? Why the reliability analysis? Uh, working in NPCIL, we conduct extensive geotechnical investigation when we go for the construction of any nuclear power plants. We conduct investigation in two steps, majorly. Uh, that is a detailed investigation, which we do before excavation. And then is the confirmatory investigation that we do after excavation, but the start of construction. Because all these clearances we need to take from our regulatory body, that is Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, ARB. So what we have seen that currently, if you see that apart from IS 1892, we do not have clear guidelines of what is the extent of investigation that needs to be done below the important structures like nuclear power plants, hydropower plants, etc. All is that like we are governed by the ARB codes, that is the CSC 2 code, which states that how much investigation we need to do below the important structures that are the safety related structures for nuclear power plant and what is to be done below the non-important or the non-safety related structures in the nuclear power plant. Now we have conducted ample amount of investigations in our site that is in Haryana, in which we are, I am right now posted. And we did some preliminary analysis of the uh, data which we have got from the investigations. But later on, uh, we conducted some more investigations due to some, some reasons or the other. And we found that the data which we got in the later investigation was somehow different from what we attained in the initial investigations. And that led us to change all the input parameters for our analysis. And we lost a lot of time in doing that in this, uh, analysis again and again. So introducing reliability analysis can actually help us determine the parameters with more confidence. Even though if we can, if we'll do some investigation at the later stages, there are chances that whatever data we have collected from the earlier investigations will remain as it is because we have already obtained that data with some confidence limits. And we don't have to change our invest, uh, input parameters for further analysis again and again. So with this motivation, I uh, started with this uh, topic and uh, the introduction is like, it is basically regarding the liquefaction assessment, which we have done at our site, because this plant, like which we are building in Haryana is one of the plant, like the one and an only nuclear power plant in India, which is actually building, which is coming up on a soil strata, which is liquefied, which is liquefied prone. So we have done some ground investigation, uh, ground improvement there, but that is different from this. So liquefaction is basically a phenomenon where the loose soil loses its uh, shear strength due to increase in pore water pressure. There are many methods to determine, uh, like the standard penetration test, cone penetration test, and the seismic borehole crossover test. We have done all these three tests at our site, uh, but right now I'll be concentrating more on the SPT. And uh, regarding the liquefaction analysis using this SPT-based approach, uh, we have used the uh, guidelines given in NC 1997 as well as in USNRC, that is uh, United States State Nuclear Regulatory Council. So the basic criteria, like as I was telling that there are no fixed guidelines of how much investigation needs to be done. But our ARB CSC2 code suggests that we should do at least one borehole below every structure. And for larger and heavier structures, that is for our important structures, we should go for one borehole per 900 square meters. And if the area is increasing for that building, we should go with more investigation. Apart from that, we should do additional boreholes at corners and along the periphery of the buildings. These are the things which all, uh, which IS 1892 also suggests, but that uh, recommends the uh, this, uh, apart from this 900 square meter, that suggests that 0.4 hectare area, if it is increasing, then we need to do one borehole only. And uh, apart from this, ARB code suggests that if the conditions are non-uniform, then we can go for even more number of boreholes, like the closer with closer spacing, so that we can actually identify the soil properties in a better way. In general, we use uh, when using SPT methodology, uh, liquefaction assessment is done for individual boreholes, and out of those boreholes, we choose the maximum depth which we have got out of all the boreholes, and we say that okay, fine, this is the liquefaction depth for my this building, and then we go on doing the other things. Although this procedure gives satisfactory results, but not conservative enough to give the idea of the entire area. 
because I have already told you the reason that once if we conduct some more investigation, there are not many chances that whatever in uh, liquefaction depth we have encountered, it may increase or decrease. So in order to deal with this problem, probabilistic distributions are used in this study uh, to assess the 95 percentile values of parameters which influence the liquefaction potential. We know that carrying out liquefaction studies using the SPD data is majorly based on the n values, the density of soil and the percentage fines of soil. So we have determined these values using the probabilistic assessment and then we have used the empirical relationship that has been given by various researchers to calculate the uh, factor of safety for liquefaction. So basically we have used uh, formulation given by given by seed and idris to you to, uh, to determine our CSR that is our cyclic stress ratio and the guidelines given in NC has been used to carry uh, to uh, determine the CRR value that is a cyclic resistance ratio. In the entire region uh, we have use the values of magnitude of earthquake 7.5 and the PGA values has been used 0.2 G. The site which I am talking is currently lying in seismic zone 3 as per IS1893 classification. So this I have already told that we are dependent upon three parameters that is n values, percentage fines and bulk density and these all parameters which are prone to error because of many reasons just uh, not just because uh, we are uh, taking these parameters at site so there are probability that due to faulty measurement due to some other reasons we may uh, determine these parameters with some what inefficiency so probabilistic techniques will take care of these methods and will give us the more conservative results as compared to the averaging technique this is basically uh, data of one of the borehole, not one of the borehole from the, uh, in, I have taken the 25 number of boreholes which we have done below the nuclear building area. The nuclear building, there are two nuclear buildings. So below that we have conducted 25 number of boreholes for investigation up to 140 meters. But I am right now concerned about only about up to 30 meters for liquefaction analysis because this is the strata which is majorly prone in fact even less than that but still i have uh, done this study for 30 meters so out of that those 25 boreholes when we take out the data for example at 16.5 meter depth so this is the variability we have received in a small area that is that area is stretching from just 200 meter by 100 meter so this is the variability which we have seen the average value at 16.5 meter for all the boreholes is lying at around 32 and uh, 32 the end value and you can see that the maximum end value is around 79 and the minimum is around 12. So if we take up only the minimum value or we take up only the average value then, they, then there are chances that at later stages we may encounter some other value and the whole analysis input may change. So how we have done it? This is for the same depth 16.5 uh, meter depth using all the 25 boreholes. This is the probability distribution function which we have made out of the data which we have collected. So as you can see, basically in geotechnical engineering, generally uh, the researchers use these three kind of functions, normal distribution function, log normal distribution function, and gamma distribution. So these distributions have been used in this study. And as you can see that the curves are almost lying closely to each other, all the three curves, when we conduct, when we do the PDF analysis of this data. Similarly, when we conduct the CDF analysis, that is the cumulative density function analysis of the data, this is also lying almost close to each other. Now we have to see that our data is lying on which distribution curve and which Sorry is Sorry to interrupt you. Please yes, take sir. care of your time. You have got only one minute's balance. Okay, okay, fine, sir, fine. Okay. Yeah. So we have to see that which distribution function is basically right for our uh, data. So here we have conducted the uh, reliability analysis on the data and based on the goodness of fit, fit test that is a chai square test and kognomoto smirnoff test we came to know that which distribution function is best for our data here we have used ks test because it is good for the cdf uh, data where we have less number of sample this is basically the chart where we can actually find out that which distribution function is good for our data 
and here we can see that the normal distribution comes out to be the best for this particular depth only I'm talking about. Similarly, we use this kind of function for uh, density function, for density, uh, our percentage fines and n values, and we find out which distribution function is best for our data at particular depth. Once we get all the data, we can make an equivalent borehole out of all the investigation we have done, and then we can conduct our uh, carry out our liquefaction analysis for an equivalent borehole rather than doing it for individual boreholes. So this is what we have got for the n values, like the average n values are red values, and the 95 percentile values are the green one. Similarly, for density we have done, and for percentage fines we have done. And this is these are the basic uh, relationship that is given in the NC and uh, USNRC to identify the CRR and CSR values and the factor of safety is CRR by CSR. So this is the equivalent borehole which we have made for 30 meter out of the 25 boreholes we have done in nuclear building. And we can see that the 95 percentile values for our corrected N values for percentage fines and our density comes out to be this. And using these values, we will input it into our uh, empirical relationship and we will derive like what is the factor of safety for liquefaction. So we have done it using three kinds of functions like the 50, per 50 percentile values, 95 percentile values and 98 percentile values. And this comes out to be our the liquefaction depth using the 95 percentile value. It comes around 14 meters. While you were using the average analysis, it was coming around 12 meter. So after conducting this test, we were able to make sure that yes, even if we conduct some later, uh, some investigation later on, this liquefaction depth will not go beyond that. So what are the conclusions that reliability based assessment of field parameters help to avoid determination of pseudo conservative results, which can be done if we have, you know, particular, if only single borehole that is giving very low value and it helps to eliminate intrinsic error associated with the determined parameters that is our end value density and the percentage fine. Using this method, data of each borehole get its due weightage as an equivalent borehole is created using data from all the boreholes. And there is very less probability that additional investigation in the future may change the overall results. Higher the percentage, percentile value, higher the conservativeness of the obtained results. In, or in other words, we can say that the probability of failure becomes lesser and lesser as the percentile goes in. This is from my side. Thank you. Okay. I don't find any questions. I good work and good presentation by Mr. Perfect. Good work, keep up. So, if any questions, if anybody has any questions to Gurpreet, please. Uh, sir, may I ask one clarification to Gurpreet please, Singh? Please, yeah, please, so it was a very nice uh, presentation, Mr. Gurpreet Singh. So for those N values you mentioned, was there any me energy measured uh, during the test or how did you get that uh, N160? No, we actually uh, used only the empirical values we have with us. We didn't uh, count, calculate any energy ratio at that time during the investigations. So we assume that whatever codes are saying that it is a 60% efficiency, then we have used those values also. Okay. Uh, okay, sir. Okay. It may not be actually correct because we have a lot of database yes, being generated. Even in IGS also, you're trying to compile the results and come out with some kind of standardization recommendation. So I was just curious. So thank you for that. Thank you. So Gurpreet, I have a simple question to you. Yes, uh, okay, your present, uh, your probabilistic assessment, everything is based on the SPT. Yes, sir. So I think that, uh, are you using only the SPT or uh, any CPT measurements you have in the same site? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have done uh, liquefaction analysis using CPT method also and using the seismic uh, crosshole techniques also. But, so what uh, exactly was your observation conclusion? Conclusion, if you see that uh, using when we take the SPT values, we have seen that the liquefaction depth we have encountered, let's say is around 12 to 13 meters. But when we use the CPT data, our liquefaction depth generally increases a bit, whatever we have compared, uh, calculated it using the SPT. So with CPT, we were getting around 16 meter of liquefaction and with SPT, we were getting around 12 meter of liquefaction depth. That may be due to because in SPT, we are taking only the discrete data at particular points. While when we conduct the CPT, we have the continuous profile. Yeah, so it may give you the better results as compared to what we take in the SPT. Also in CPT, uh, it is the complete mechanized system is there. So the chances of error are less as compared to what we do in uh, SPT. As Patha Sathi has told that we need to calculate the energy also during the time of testing. 
so there are things that may differ cpt and spt and i would say that cpt would be the best technique to use uh, to go ahead so you would ask the is 8093 to change the you know the, the parameter used for that uh, liquefaction potential yeah sure sure <laughs> that needs to be done okay fine okay thank you sir can you sir uh, shall we go to the next student yes sir Okay. Okay. We have the next presentation for. Uh, I think it's the uncertainty analysis in liquefaction potential assessment by Nikhil Gupta, B. Uh, Bark, Mumbai, India. So, Nikhil, can you please? A very good afternoon to all. I, Nikhil Gupta from B. A. R. C. Uh, presenting on the topic uncertainty analysis in liquefaction potential assessment. Uh, Co-authors are Dr. Ranjan Kumar and Dr. Kapilesh Bhargava from BIRC. Uh, first thing is, what is liquefaction and its consequence? Uh, liquefaction is a condition where soil undergoes undergoes a continuation uh, continuous deformation like fluid at low stress out without any resistance. The consequence of liquefaction: liquefaction may cause settlement or differential settlement of the structure, and for sloping ground, it it can cause possibility of landslide. and for uh, if it occur beneath safety related nuclear structure it will cause severe hazard to the life liquefaction how it is occurs it occurs in saturated cohesion less soil why in only in saturated cohesion less soil because of earthquake vibration cyclic stress is generated this cyclic stress is leads to generation of positive excess pore water pressure the excess pore water pressure try to separate out soil particle The strength of soil which is gained by intergranular friction between soil is reduced to a insignificant level and for uh, design of safety related uh, structure we have to carry out liquefaction assessment this is the plan view of a nuclear site okay uh, the analysis is carried out for 38 boreholes highlight of the problem empirical methods are available for liquefaction as assessment as per is 1893 part 1 but this empirical this has empirical methods have some limitations it considers fixed acceleration value fixed uh, pg value over entire depth and it doesn't simulate the actual site condition and effect of earthquake parameters like frequency and amplitude is doesn't accounted this uh, limitation is account for in if we carried out one dimension site specific ground response analysis okay but this uh, ground response analysis also has some limitation we have uh, used some input parameters they have some uh, limitation in, in its measurement uh, like human error or uh, instrumental error but uh, uncertainty and associated with this input parameters uh, so to carry it out to account for this uncertainty in uh, ground response analysis we have to carry it out uncertainty analysis uh, these five are uh, uncertain in input parameter like uh, total stress effective stress maximum acceleration percentage of pines and spt count uh, we have 38 borehole data at each depth each every 1 meter depth for all un uncertain input parameters so we can uh, and for a maximum a maximum maximum acceleration 38 data at every depth every 1 meter depth is carried out by site specific ground response analysis then we can calculate probability uh, parameters like mean and standard deviation for 38 data at every depth for each uncertain input parameters uh, these are the probabilistic parameters for uh, mean and coefficient of variation for uh, these five uncertain input parameters okay for every 1 meter depth up to 10th meter depth so now uh, we have to find out the probability distribution which this un uncertain input parameter can be followed uh, by chi square test and ks test chi square test is based on uh, probability density function and ks test is based on community distribution function and we have observed that uh, total stress effective stress maximum acceleration and percentage of fines follow normal distribution and spt count are follow log normal distribution and determination determination of liquefaction potential for liquefaction assessment two variables are required we know all know like cyclic resistance ratio and cyclic stress ratio cyclic resistance ratio is calculated by uh, this uh, formula which is given in is 193 uh, this empirical formula where n160 cs is the corrected spt n value 
and cyclic stress ratio is the ratio of average equivalent shear stress generated at the depth due to ground shaking to the effective stress this is a multiplication function and this is calculated by this empirical for, uh, this formula and site is liquefiable is resistance ratio is less than stress ratio okay now calculation of probability of liquefaction uh, we have mean and standard deviation for five uncertain input parameter at every 1 meter depth then we can generate 40 numbers of render, random variables for each uncertain parameter by latin hypercube technique then uh, the for, from this 40 numbers of random variable we can calculate 40 numbers of csr and crr at each depth then uh, this 40 numbers of csr and crr we can calculate 40 <coughs> Uh, this probabilistic parameter like mean and standard deviation of TRR and CSR. Okay. Now we have uh, mean and standard deviation for CSR and CRR. Then a function, liquefaction performance function is defined as difference of CRR and CSR value. Then its mean is difference of mean of CRR and difference of mean of CSR. And its standard deviation is square root of uh, CRR and square root plus CSR. Now, see, we know uh, CRR is dependent on only on SPT value, and it is uh, see, uh, SPT M value is uh, log normal distributed. Then CRR is also log normal is distributed, and CSR is a uh, multiplication function. We all know. Then CSR is also follow log normal distribution. Then we can calculate reliability index or liquefaction probability by this formula, where LNR. Log normal, log, uh, logarithmic standard deviation of CSR and CRR. Then for entire site, we have uh, for each depth, we have mean value and coefficient of variation of CSR and CRR. Then we can calculate probability of uh, liquefaction by uh, formula which I given in uh, previous slide. We uh, it is observed that probability of this, uh, liquefaction at upper layer it's seven percent. And at lower there, layer, there is no chance of liquefaction at site. And uh, this probability of liquefaction uh, is for entire site. And if I consider the critical boreholes, which have factor of safety 1.2, which I found in empirical method, this critical boreholes is considered for uncertainty analysis. Then uh, observed value of uh, uncertain parameter is calculated. Uh, is, assumed as mean value and coefficient of variation is taken as the coefficient of variation as site. Then uh, 40 numbers of same like the same procedures, 40 numbers of uh, random variable are generated for each uncertain input parameter at every one meter depth. Then we can calculate 40 number of CSR and CRR and we can calculate mean and coefficient of variation of CSR and CRR. From this mean and coefficient of variation, we can calculate the probability of the probability of liquefaction for these four critical boreholes. Here it is observed that for borehole 14, probability of liquefaction at upper layer is 24%. And for borehole 26, it is also 27%. And for borehole 31, it is at upper layer, it is 38% at and up to 5 meter depth, it is 33%. It, it means it is more prone to liquefaction. And for borehole 33, uh, at upper layer, it, uh, there is no chance of liquefaction because probability of liquefaction is 3% only. But at mid depth, probability of liquefaction is 42% in these critical boreholes. See, this uh, result can be shown as a, in graph. Now, uh, we can also find out this probability of liquefaction by near field and far field earthquake. Uh, nine near field and seven far field earthquake. First thing is what is near field? Um, as per NBC, uh, if epicentral distance is less than 15 kilometer, this earthquake is called as near field earthquake. So in this study, we have taken nine near field earthquake data and seven far, far field earthquake data. For nine near field earthquake data, nine value of CSR, and nine value of uh, CSR from non-linear analysis and nine value of CSR from equivalent linear analysis. Sorry, Nikhil, your time is running up, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir.
for uh, far filler fit seven uh, C, uh, CSR for non-linear and seven for equivalent linear. Then we can calculate mean value of CSR and coefficient of variation uh, is uh, taken from the coefficient of variation of for entire site. And then probability of liquefaction we can find out. Here it is observed that for far field earthquake at same PG value probability of liquefaction is higher. See result and conclusion. Uh, total stress, effective stress, maximum acceleration and percentage of fines follow low normal distribution. And SPTN value follow, uh, follow this follow no, normal distribution and SPTN value follows low normal distribution. From empirical method, four boroughs are observed liquefiable or factor of safety less than 1.2 out of 38 boroughs. Um, these critical four boroughs are selected for uh, uh, more detailed analysis like ground response analysis and uncertainty analysis. And CSR at bedrock is reduced from 0.1 G to a significant level uh, because of this uh, soil strata. And for the same PG value, far field earthquake is more susceptible to liquefaction than near field earthquake because at same PG value, far field earthquake have more frequency content than near field earthquake. Then the sum of amplitude for far field earthquake is higher than near field earthquake. That's why far field earthquake is more susceptible at same PG value. Thank you, sir. Okay, okay. thanks a lot, uh, Nikhil. Uh, it's a good presentation regarding the uncertainty analysis of the liquefaction. Uh, yes. But um, I think, the, let me just check the Q&A. So, you know, sir, I think in the Q&A, do you see any questions? There is one question earlier, that is, uh, I think that question has been deleted. I think they, they, somebody was trying to find out whether this is about probability of liquefaction at the beginning of the presentation. I think Mr. Mr. Nickel no, covered it presently, in the subject. Yes, sir. Yeah, presently, we do not have any open questions. I, I think, am I right? Yeah, correct. Okay, so and in the chat that? box, there is one question. Yes, sir. Uh, whether the data for entire depth is following same distribution. It is by Mr. Gurpreet Singh. Uh, sir, uh, pardon, please, sir. Mr. Nikhil, can you answer this question? Whether the data for entire depth is following same distribution. That is, uh, no, you stated no, that uh, other than SPT, they are following. Uh, Normal distribution and uh, SPT is following log normal distribution. I have cal calculated for each depth, each every one meter depth. I have calculated for every one meter depth which kind of distribution is followed for each uncertain input parameter. Then I have observed for every one meter depth, except then SPT and value, uh, remaining four random variables are followed and normal distribution only for every one meter depth. May I ask one question? Yes, sir. Yeah, please, please, sir. Uh, what is the uh, what is depth of groundwater table? Uh, sir, um, uh, in this case, I have assumed that ground uh, groundwater table is at ground level, uh, means zero zero meter uh, for uh, design of for safer site. I have taken it yes. at ground level. I realized the uh, uh, potential for liquefaction is quite high for. Yeah, upper layer. one 1.5 meter. It yes. may not necessarily true because uh, the method you are using is uh, um, is biased toward low low depth. So if you do the calculation, you will see. No, sir. So for design of safety related site, yeah. I have to take an it, it is in a uh, safer site like groundwater is a top layer. And for uh, see, we have empirical method for assessment. But for safety design, I have also carried out uncertainty analysis that um, at the, uh, uh, when the uh, uh, measurement are taken, the groundwater level is some at level. But um, so this uncertain input as an uncertain parameter, this uncertainty also account in this uh, study. Any anyway, good presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh... Nikhil, I have a small question for you. Yes, sir. Okay, here we have taken care of the uncertainty in the liquefaction in terms of, for example, the probabilistic parameters. Yes, sir. So, okay, we also know that uh, this earthquake itself is a probabilistic event. Yes, so we sir. have got some kind of the concept of a return period because we consider, for example, for the design purpose, one return period, for example, it could be 2000 years or could be say 500 years. So we don't apply this probabilistic concept to your final implementation. 
how do you include the probability concepts in the earthquake occurrence as well? Because that's because it's a matter of conditional probability or a joint probability. Sir, uh, as per empirical method, uh, this uh, uh, earthquake factor is uh, taken as the PJ value. And for empirical method, this site lies in seismic zone second, then we take it PJ value is 0.1G. Okay. And uh, for this uncertainty in earthquake factor, I have carried out ground response analysis for taken various kind of earthquake and uh, this is study. Uh, 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 but and as per National Disaster, Disaster Management, Management Authority report, that for this site, maximum uh, susceptible earthquake is at magnitude 6.5. Then my study is based on 6.5 earth magnitude earthquake. Okay. So, Sridhar, sir, any questions? No, nothing specific. Partha Sarth, sir? Ah, uh, no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. you. Can continue, please. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Nikhil. So we'll go to the third presentation. The third paper is uh, titled "Support Vector Machine for Evaluation of Liquefaction Potential Using SPT Data by Wamsi Allah." Wamsi, please join us. National Institute of Technology, Rurkila, India. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omchi Allah. Now I'm going to do a presentation on topic support vector machine for evaluation of liquefaction potential using SPT data. Overview, introduction, literature review, support vector machine, SVM classifiers, SVM analysis, and uh, summary of SVM classifications and conclusion. And report. Soil liquefaction occurs with the saturated or party, partially saturated soil substantially. Also, strength and stiffness in response to applied stress such as taking uh, during a sudden uh, dynamic loads in which material that is not a liquid. This is the liquefaction occurred in uh, Washington 2001, and this is liquefaction occurred in Space Church, uh, New Zealand in 2011. And uh, generally, what is meant by liquefaction? If a mass of a sand in a saturated conditions with a greater wire ratio. Then, the critical, then its critical wire ratio is subject to the suddenly applied uh, shearing stress, uh, maybe because of an earthquake or because of a heavy blasting or, or maybe in a dynamic force, the sand tends to decrease in volume. As a result, the pore water pressure, uh, pore water is subjected to uh, hydrostatic excess pressure and uh, the portion of weight overlying, overlying by the material is transferred to the pore water, uh, transferred to the water and because of that, the pore water is increased. So effective stress in the soil is thus reduced. So, since the shearing strength, of, sh shearing strength of the granular soil depends on the affective stress, this transfer of pressure causes sudden, sudden decrease in the shearing stress. If this reduced uh, value, residual, reduced a value which is below the applied shearing stress, the mass of the soil will failure in shear. This type of failure is referred as liquefaction. And this is soil liquefaction, typical example of soil liquefaction, where loosely packed grains of soil are held together by the friction and the pores of uh, pore spaces are uh, occupied by water. But because of this, uh, because of earthquake or any other dynamic force, uh, the shaking occurs. The sh this destabilizes the soil by increasing the space between the grains. Because of which the structures, of, uh, structures lying above the uh, top above the soil will fail. This is the uh, Nigata uh, earthquake, Japan, in 19, which has occurred in 1964, and this is Christchurch, New Zealand, 2011. And uh, the uh, there are many, uh, there are two uh, determinic, uh, there are uh, two types of approaches in uh, determining uh, liquefaction pressure. One is determinic, deterministic approach. In deterministic approach, we ha uh, uh, have collected some literature, and this is and Bolanger, 2006. They have re examined the existing some empirical procedures and recommended revised corrections for, correlations for the uh, correlations, and that, that is CSR yes, cyclic stress ratio and the CRR values. And, uh, Yudis and Yud and Idris in 2001 published a summary paper of 1996, 1996 and 1998 NCER workshop with updates to original simplified procedure and they have proposed the CSR and CRR value and are related to support vector machine. Lee and Shen in 2013 presented support vector machine based approach for prediction of liquefaction and they compared SVM model with the artificial neural network and found that artificial uh, SVM is uh, uh, is he's having a greater classification accuracy than ANN. And go on, go on, go in 2007. In their study, they used support vector machines 
but for a CP, yeah, uh, based on the Juwang et al. 2003, for the entire data, the overall classification was uh, 98%, which was better than Juwang et al. in 2003. And SVM, introduced as a classifier by Cortis and Vapidic in 1995, SVM, SVM machines are supervised learning models with associated learning algorithms that analyze the classification and regression analysis. SVM is one of the most reliable soft computing techniques, which is a supervised learning model to predict the dependent variables on terms of the independent variable. The objective of uh, support vector emission SVM algorithm is to find a hyperplane uh, in n dimensional feature space that distinctly classifies the two, uh, data points. In a, in a support vector machine, the hyperplane can be a hyperplane, hyperplane equation is f of x is equal to wx plus b is equal to 0. Uh, where uh, W is R power N, that is in uh, n dimensional feature space, and the B bias is in uh, R, one dimensional feature space. One space. In, sub, uh, in uh, SVM, the Wx plus B is greater than 1, and the Wx plus B less than, less than or equal to minus 1 is combined to form an equation. And we have, inclu uh, have uh, uh, implemented the slack variable, which is greater than 0, that is zeta i. And the above equation, uh, the above equation can be formed, uh, written as y i w x i plus b should be greater than or equal to one minus theta i. And from that, we will we will calculate the margin value. The margin value for uh, uh, hyperplane is two by uh, mod of w. We have the main aim of the SVM is to maximize this margin considering the cost function. This is upper vector with maximum margin, which was taken from SAMU 2013. This is margin. The margin two by uh, mod w uh, should be maximum as maximum as possible, such that there should not be any outliers in the in the uh, hyperplane that is near to the hyperplane. We have taken a CSVM, new SVM, bound transient CSVM, Western Watkins multi-class SVM, Kramer singles multi-class SVM for analysis, and data set and reprocessing. In this in this work. We have taken the database of liquefaction potential based on SPT values uh, by using determinic approaches. The data consists of 532 cases. The data represents SPT value of uh, different sites in, in, located in India. The factor of safety is the ratio of uh, from here. The, we have to calculate the factor of safety. Uh, it is the ratio of cyclic stress ratio CRR to the cyclic uh, cyclic resistance ratio CRR to the cyclic stress ratio CSR. The liquefaction is predicted to occur if the factor of safety is uh, less than or equal to one. If it is greater than one, the uh, liquefaction will not occur. After evaluation, we have observed we have observed that 276 liquefaction liquefied cases are present and 256 non-liquefied cases are present. The CSR value is calculated according to the given formula. And uh, the in input variables consider are depth of interest, SPT value, bulk density at the depth of interest, saturated density at the same depth, groundwater table, fine contents, the epithetic ma moment magnitude. The output concerns of the classification, that is Y value in SVM, is liquefied, whether it will soil be liquefy or non liquefy in deterministic approach. These are the curves that we have used in this work the linear, linear, linear kernel, Austrian radius, Gaussian uh, radial basis function kernel, quantum well, kernel, Mr. Bonsi, Sorry kernel. to interrupt you. Sir? We are running uh, yes. short of time. So oh. please. Okay, okay. Sir. Hyperbolic tangent kernel, Bessel function kernel, Laplace radial basis function, and our radial basis function kernel, and the linear split kernel dimension. The optimum model, the optimum model we have taken the, uh, the mixing, training and testing of SVM for classification problem using R studio. And uh, the model, the model which we have, we get, we have least number of misclassification that is considered uh, optimum model that was training performance testing for calculated by. by equating the number of data predicted updated by SVM by total data into 100. The SVM parameters, the database of liquefaction potential is 532 SPT values. And from the factor of safety is, uh, is, ca is calculated. Liquefaction is based, uh, if, the, if the factor of safety value is greater than one, then the, uh, that uh, data is considered to be non-liquefiable uh, non soil. If it is less than or equal to one, then it is considered as a After evaluation of some cases and two non-liquefied cases are are, are observed and the optimum model is calculated based on the uh, uh, based upon the operations that have that we have observed and their uh, number of support vector that we have obtained uh, see for csm us uh, 
bound function SVM, external variance multiplex SVM, grammar single multiplex SVM, and in this training uh, in, uh, from the above 532 data, in the training data, we have my one and six cases were liquefiable cases. In test data, eight cases were liquefiable cases and eight cases were non liquefiable cases. This optimal model we have chosen. Uh, Give, has given the least number of misclassification or better accuracy. And uh, the um, among the above models which we have taken, a CSV classifier with a radial basis channel has given the best uh, results. And these are the summary of this. This is a conclusion. The liquefaction data based upon the SPT data obtained from deterministic approach is analyzed to develop, the, develop an SVM model. In this SVM model, CSV classifier with radial basis scandal function uh, using cost parameter and gamma parameter 0 0.49 uh, has given the best result. The training accuracy is 99.19% and the testing accuracy is 91.25%. Uh, generally, radial basis function channel and polynomial channel are found to be more useful in terms of accuracy of the model. And the bone constant CSVM and the Watson and uh, Western and Watson uh, and the Kramer single SVM are, are uh, shown to be having good generalization capacity capacity in the above data, from the above data. And these are the references. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vamsi, for that good presentation on uh, SVM for thank the prediction you. of liquefaction. Uh, sir, uh, Srinivas, sir, do you have any? There are, I think there are one question. Sir. I think they suggested some question. It should be you data in your... Uh, References. Sir? Sir, uh, once in your uh, presentation, somewhere you mentioned the others for your reference data. There is some correction suggested. You data. You can see the QA. Hello? Uh, sir, sir, I'm not it, sir. Okay, fine. That's a data from that. Yeah. That's nothing more than that. Good presentation. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor you Mizanur, do you have any query, sir? No, uh, thank you. Uh, that's fine. Uh, okay. Anything Professor artificial? Sir. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 sir. Yeah, all of okay. them are same. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. So we have to change our practice now because uh, all these models are excellent uh, models, but the input uh, into the model. Uh, how reliable it is is the question now. So I think uh, it's a big question, to, sir. <laughs> yeah, we have to work together. See that there will be standardization first, and then we will have the uniformity of uh, uh, the test performed across the country, so that you know these models becomes very relevant. Relevant. Yes, so sir. otherwise, uh, the models are fantastic, but the input you no, know, that uh, also does matter. Thank so, you. So uh, that's a very healthy suggestion from Parthasarji, sir. We have got a lot of research work going on but need to be, you know, collected together and we need to sit together so that it will be a very valuable tool for the future generation. Okay, thanks a lot, sir, for the wonderful suggestion. So I think uh, now is the time we go for the fourth presentation. We have uh, the fourth presentation that is liquefaction mitigation of silty sands using xanthan biopolymer by S. Smitha of NIT Calicut. So Smitha, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the topic of my presentation is liquefaction mitigation of silty sand using xanthan biopolymer. Uh, so uh, we have already seen soil liquefaction causes tremendous damages to foundation and infrastructure facilities. And from many past earthquakes also it is very visible. And a unique, efficient and sustainable solution to mitigate liquefaction in fine and silty sand need to be evolved. But uh, the already existing practices are not so sustainable and the, therefore we need a sustainable and efficient solution for liquefaction mitigation. So what is liquefaction? It's the rapid generation of excess pore pressure in saturated soil mass when subjected to cyclic loading or ground shaking. The soil mass behaves like liquid, possessing zero shear strength. So here we can see the buried structures may rise above the ground and the structures on the surface may sink due to this liquefaction when the soil behaves like a liquid. So this mainly, this is due to the excess pore pressure buildup in uh, cohesionless soils like silty sand or fine sand. So here we can see the mechanism of uh, liquefaction. Initially, the particles had contacts with each other. 
but when after liquefaction the particles loses its contact due to the pore pressure build up and uh, the soil itself behaves like a liquid so the materials for the present study was silty sand uh, already uh, possessing it causes zero cohesion and uh, it was collected from wayana district in kerala itself then the biopolymer used for the mitigation for um, additive use was biopolymer and santan biopolymer was chosen from for the present study it was procured from urban platter this is the, the properties of silky sand so we'll see what bio what are biopolymers biopolymers are of biological origin and environmental friendly many such examples of biopolymers are agar santan guar chitosin etc they are mostly produced by living organisms like algae fungus or bacteria and consist of polysaccharides which are compounds made up of monosaccharides linked at certain locations their common applications are in food industry and pharmaceutical industry as stabilizers thickeners and gelling agents it has been already explored for erosion control hydraulic conductivity and also for improvement of shear strength of soil but for liquefaction mitigation it hasn't been much explored why we have we are using biopolymers the main reason is its sustainability uh, it is sustainable in terms of both economic environmental and social aspect because it supports vegetation in soil and do not harm the soil organisms it is cost effective is produced in bulk and also it doesn't harm the existing structures and in terms of labor also it is uh, less labor intensive then gel type biopolymers will fill the pore spaces in soil hence densifying it many biopolymers are also hydrophilic in nature and then they can absorb water to form a viscous hydrogel uh, in at developed sites sites uh, the conventional methods are very difficult to implement so this is uh, best for such sites and it can be introduced in soil by various practical modes of application including mixing injection spraying grouting uh, for the purpose of building materials or pavement erosion control etc so for the present study the biopolymer chosen was santan um, it is sorry. it is um, mainly used in food industry as rheology modifier and in oil recovery petroleum industry It is produced from fermentation of glucose or sucrose by uh, bacteria Saccharomonas campestris. Camp, camp, it's anionic in nature. Uh, here we can see the uh, chemical structure of the santan biopolymer. It is obtained as a powder form from the manufacturer. Uh, uh, it is pseudo plastic in nature. That is, its viscosity get modified by shear stress. the stable over a wide range of temperature and ph and also resistant to enzymatic attack due to structural backbone then uh, the experimental plan consists of conducting a series of consolidated and drained static reaction tests the uh, for the for that purpose the untreated samples of uh, uh, 30% related nst is representing loose soil condition was uh, prepared by dry funnel deposition method and uh, the uh, it can the test consists of saturation consolidation and shearing saturation was carried out by carbon dioxide saturation water circulation and post saturation till a b value of 0.95 was reached so for the treated soil uh, the um, required amount of soil is corresponding to 30% related and it was taken and it was mixed uh, in a dry form with the biopolymer the required percentage of dry biopolymer and then uh, water was poured into it and it was mixed well and cast into split molds after that after, uh, after the required curing time it was extracted from the molds and kept for curing so here we can see the cylindrical sandy samples which were uh, treated with santan biopolymer first we'll see uh, about the pore pressure response obtained from static traction test so uh, here itself we can see a significant decrease in pore pressure was obtained uh, when uh, compared to untreated soil so uh, the curing times of 3 days 7 days and 28 days was adopted to 2% santan treatment so the pore pressure ratio that is the pore per excess pore pressure to the effective confining pressure was calculated and it is plotted for comparison here we can see that uh, at 50 kp even though uh, the pore pressure uh, the reduction was less but at higher confining pressure the pore pressure reduction was very evident 
and this is due to the hydrophilic nature of the biopolymer gel present inside the soil particles which can absorb the water and uh, the excess pore pressure build up uh, which might be caused by water present inside the soil is now replaced by xanthan gel which takes up the pressure and uh, obviously the pressure caused by xanthan gel its excess pore pressure caused by xanthan gel will be lesser compared to when water was present so this is a sample uh, pore pressure graphs this is untreated soil and treated soil also the strain at which the maximum pore pressure was reached in untreated soil was also higher when compared to untreated soil so uh, this is the stress ratios at uh, 15% strain Uh, stress ratio is calculated by uh, uh, ratio of deviatoric stress to effective confining stress. So here also we can see the stress ratio was improved a lot due to the treatment. So this shows the resistance to take up stresses uh, in xanthan treated soil. This is an uh, example of this uh, deviatoric stress response. Comparison at three uh, curing times. Here we can see that as the curing time increased. Uh, It's the deviatoric stress put up by the sample is also increasing, but at seven days and twenty eight days the response is almost similar. This is the stress stress path response of the soil. For untreated soil, we can see a uh, stress path is calculated. Um, it's it is the um, ratio Q versus P dash diagram. Here we can see that the for untreated soil it shows showed a contractive type of response but for as uh, treated soil and as the curing time increased the dilatory response was formed this indicated that a dense uh, den the soil was densified as a result of treatment and the densification also increased with increase in curing period so the xanthan gum might occupy the pore spaces in soil which densified densified the loose silty sand This are the shear strength parameters. Both total shear strength parameter and effective strength uh, parameters was calculated. Here also we can see that in untreated soil, a very high increment in C value means cohesion was obtained due to xanthan treatment. And also that also increased with increase in curing period. Uh, the initially the soil had zero kp of cohesion and As the curing time in increased as much as sixty sixty four times, uh, means kp of cohesion was obtained. The uh, friction angle was found to reduce a little, but still uh, it was compensated by the increase in cohesion. These are the uh, this shows the mechanism of treatment by uh, SCM images. Here, untreated soil and treated soil are compared. Compared here, we can uh, see that the xanthan gum has. Uh, Densified and also reduce the pore pressure built up by aggregate formation, pore filling, and biopolymer connection bridges. So the aggregates can be observed here, and also the interlinks form interlinks form between two or more soil particles can be seen here. So the conclusions uh, is significant enhancement in cohesion was observed for the treated soil, tall xanthan gum pattern, and curing times. Excess pore pressure build up at the failure strain was drastically reduced from eighty two. To forty-one percent due to the biopolymer treatments treat, treatment in silty sand. A significant increase in the stress ratio in treated soil was observed. The increase from point seven five in untreated soil to as much as one point one four in two percent twenty-eight day cured xanthan treated soil with an effective confining pressure of one fifty kg. This is my references. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Smita, for a very wonderful presentation. On the improvement of the liquefaction potential by the addition of this biopolymer. So, you, sir. Uh, so Srinivas, sir, uh, any queries? Any? No, oh, it's an interesting study. And uh, Miss Mitha, one question. Suppose yes. uh, if you are, uh, what is the life of this biopolymer? How long it will be effective? Uh, I had tried the durability uh, aspect also, sir. Uh, yeah. No, sir. Long term effect also I had studied. Yeah. Uh, I had kept the uh, curing time for one year also. So it it was working fine with one year up to one year from my scope of study. I had done up to one year curing period and almost the strength loss was very less when compared to twenty eight days. So uh, I think it will work up to one year uh, and also durability study by wetting drying analysis also I had done. 
and it was uh, it had sustained up to six wetting drying cycles, six to seven wetting drying cycles. Also, it is sustaining with two percent treatment. Okay. Suppose if we go for implementation in the field, you suggest every uh, one year we have to charge the ground with this uh, compound. Uh, actually, I haven't uh, done beyond that, sir. If we, uh, okay. I can, I will be studying that later. Okay. Uh, other durability aspects also I need to study. Means acid resistance and other uh, aspects of durability also I might might be studying in future. Yeah. Good study, keep it up. Sir, Arthur, sir, this, sir, any yeah. valuable comments? No, no, sir has already asked. It was uh, oh, the okay. implementation in practice. Uh, so she, uh, he has already asked that question. Thank you. Sir. Okay. You can continue. Uh, I, okay. I have become. Oh, sir, Arman, you should uh, yeah, please, advise this young girl. Yeah, Asmita, um, I actually liked your work. I think it has a good value and uh, novelty for good publication. But I have a few concerns. I see your um, pool water pressure ratio graph. Can you go back to the end? Okay. Uh, Phil. I thought you got a pool water pressure ratio higher than one. How do you get that? Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, this is actually pool pressure, excess pool pressure, not um, pool water ratio. Actually, okay. uh, this graph represents pore pressure. This is pore pressure ratio. Okay, uh, here. So just pore a habit, it could be a mistake, but pore pressure ratio. Uh, I'll, uh, this is actually pore pressure ratio. Here it is higher than one. I'll check that, sir. Once uh, I'll check that value. Now that's fun. I, I see it has a very good potential for novelty or for a good publication, but I see a few other things you could improve. Thank uh, you. Can I go, go to the next slide? I probably thought another thing I could suggest you to improve. If you have time, otherwise just... Which, uh, which slide, sir? Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah. no, the previous one, uh, just after the board. Okay. Uh, that's... I could have liked lots. I have lots of fun. I can see that untreated one quite expected behavior, whereas um, you with uh, with treated, it's a little bit different. Uh, sorry, Go, sir. Next. Uh, Go next. Go next. 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 Next slide. Okay. Next one. Next one, please. Okay. Um, okay. You just uh, simply extended this live uh, line to zero P to get C value. Okay. Uh -huh. oh, okay, sir. I'll how do you get C? How do, how do you get C? Actually, that was uh, calculated from this one itself. It's a modified failure envelope using the stress path diagram. Uh, not, not from uh, here. Uh, from here itself, sir. But uh, in this graph, I haven't shown that. Okay. It, if it is triaxial, that is quite unusual to get an um, M line, the failure line, uh, that intercepting Q with P equal to zero. Okay. Um, just look at that. You might need some readjustment. It could be some bias in the testing device, but I think your thought, your work has some value. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Smitha, uh, how did you saturate this? How much time it took? Uh, it was saturation was actually uh, it was a little bit one or two hours extra than untreated soil, sir, because it is hydrophilic and it will absorb water. The saturation process was okay. Means it was uh, not that much different than the untreated soil. But I did CO two saturation, then water circulation for about two hours to three hours. I had to do water circulation. Then pressure saturation by incrementing the uh, back pressure and cell pressure value. How much right. time it was taking? Uh, it took about half a day. It's, uh, four to five hours. Four to five hours. It took complete process. Did you apply any back pressure? Yes, sir. Back pressure and cell pressure. I mean, uh, incremental back pressure and cell pressure by keeping an interval of 20 
uh, KP between them. I had to go up to 300, 300 uh, back pressure. So I maintained the back pressure for all the tests uh, for comparing the results. Okay. It's, you, your work is good, but if you want to go a good quality journal like this, uh, you just have to improve your analysis. Your work is suffering yes. from your analysis and presentation, uh, graphical yes. presentation, not yours. Yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot, sir, for your very valuable comments. I think that uh, Professor uh, Mizanur's comments will definitely add, you know, the research value so that you can go for very, very, uh, very good journals for the publication of your work. You can look at that sure, uh, question intercepts which were calculated, I think. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll find it out. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. That I'll change. Uh, that I'll rectify. Yeah, yeah. So you know, small, one small question. Uh, yes, do you sir? have any kind of a work reported in the li literature using the same polymer? Sangdan, any kind of a work reported in literature? Yes, sir. Uh, there are work, um, but not uh, from liquefaction mitigation point of view. Uh, they have done like shear strength testing and other, using other biopolymers. Uh, I have um, publications are actually uh, using cyclic reaction testing. I have one, two publications. Then others have also got uh, using Bender element test like that. Uh, few tests are there. From liquefaction mitigation aspect, there are very few studies using biopolymers. Those are coming. No, why did I ask this specific question is, we are still not sure regarding the life of the biopolymer. Am I right? Uh, but for so, improvement purpose, uh, general aspects like hydraulic conductivity uh, reduction, shear strength improvement, and all there are many studies coming up, sir. It's nowadays, it's a, so. I okay, okay, Smita. Thanks a lot for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Okay, sir. so I think uh, it's a time that we move to the next one. So. So the, let us go to the last one that is the addressing influence of a prefabricated vertical drains in liquefaction resistance under multiple shaking events by Gautam Patmanabhan, IIT, Turkey, India. Thank you, sir. Gautam, please go ahead. Sir. Myself, Gautam, PhD research scholar from the Department of Earthquake Engineering, IIT, Turkey, India. Uh, I am here to present paper on the title Addressing Influence of Prefabricated Vertical Rights in Liquefaction Resistance Under Multiple Shaking Events, guided by Dr. S. Ganesh Kumar, scientist CBRI, Ruti. Liquefaction is an interesting and an evergreen research topic in geotechnical earthquake engineering. It results in saturated sand deposits due to the generation of excess pore water pressure during a seismic loading. It results in uh, ground failure. Uh, damage to existing foundations and structure. The figure shows a typical ground failure observed during the 1964 Nigata earthquake in Japan. Many ground improvement techniques have been proposed and installed in the field to mitigate liquefaction. Some of the commonly used techniques are stone column, sand compaction pipes, prefabricated vertical rates, grouting, and many more. The figure shows a typical uh, PV install uh, improvement system in the field. Coming to the motivation, Unlike other ground improvement studies, this study has its own novelty, the selection of seismic input motion. Multiple or repeated shaking events has been proposed and tested. Uh, it means a sand deposit which is liquefied once can be re-liquefied again during the successive seismic events. This pattern has been observed in the 2015 Nepal earthquake and a map has been shown for reference. And the next is the, the performance and the efficiency of prefabricated vertical rate improvement system have never been tested under multiple shaking events. This is a major motivation behind taking up this study. Coming to the material properties, the sand used in the study has been procured from Solani Riverbed Uti. The index properties have been tested and is presented in the table one for uh, reference. And uh, most importantly, the grain size distribution of the curve, uh, the sand, shows that it lies in the potentially liquefiable range as per Zenakin Astro Polo study in 2003. Coming to the PVD, the PVD was used in the study was sponsored by Tech Farm India Industries Private Limited Mumbai. Uh, PVD is a rectangular strip with a dimension of 100 mm by 4 mm with a plastic core encased by a geosynthetic filler. The properties of PVD are shown in the table too. Coming to the experimental setup, the experiments are carried out using a uniaxial shake table available in CBRI Ruki. It is uh, controlled by a digital data acquisition system which can accept frequency up to uh, 50 Hz and uh, acceleration up to 1 G. 
transparent container of dimension 1.4 meter by 1 meter by 1 meter was mounted over the shake table to uh, prepare the sand bed. Polyurethane foam of 5 centimeter thickness has been placed on both the sides of the shaking direction to, uh, to weaken the boundary effects. Coming to the loading condition, in a freshly prepared sand deposit, an acceleration of 0.1G has been applied, followed by 0.2G, 0.3G, and finally 0.4G in the same sand deposit under a constant frequency of 5 Hz and a shaking duration of 40 seconds. The uh, container has been shown in figure 3, and uh, PVD uh, as a total PVD system was shown in figure 4 for reference. Coming to the experimental study, the sand bed was prepared to a sand density of 40% and 60%. A uh, specially designed hopper was used to pour the sand from a particular height to achieve the desired sand density. Uh, once the sand bed, is uh, sand bed is prepared for a total depth of 600 mm, a two pore pressure transducers were embedded at a height of 200 and 400 mm from the bottom of the tank to monitor the generation and dissipation of excess pore water pressure. Once the sand bed is prepared, uh, DCPT digital static cone penetrometer experiments have been carried out throughout the depth at random location to determine the density uh, achieved. Finally, in for improvement system, a 10 number of prefabricated vertical rings are installed in a triangular pattern with a 200 mm center to center spacing. So, uh, the figure 5 shows the sequence of uh, sample preparation and installation of PVD. The PVD was installed using a specially designed mantle without causing much disturbance to the sand deposit. Coming to the results and discussion, the time history of excess pore water pressure was observed using the pore pressure transducer and has been presented. Uh, from the figure, it is clear that for 0.1G acceleration loading, there is no generation of excess pore water pressure was observed in the treated system. So it means that uh, PPD was very effective in controlling liquefaction at 0.1G for 40% sand density. In, in addition to that, for 0.2G, 0.3G, and 0.4G loading, there is a significant reduction in the generation of excess pore water pressure was observed and uh, for both uh, bottom and top piece of meters. Uh, in case of 60% relative density sand deposit, uh, in addition to 0.1G, there is no observation of excess pore water pressure was reported for 0.2G acceleration loading as well. So, for uh, in under 60% sand density, both 0.1G and 0.2G loading are entirely safe for liquefaction. And also, a significant reduction in excess pore water pressure was observed in the uh, 0.3G and 0.4G acceleration loading as well. So, the, uh, from the time history analysis of excess pore water pressure, we can, uh, we can predict that the improvement of uh, PVD improvement system was quite good and it uh, resists the generation of excess pore water pressure. Coming to the time taken to attain the maximum pore pressure ratio for both 40 and 60 percent RD, uh, it is one important thing is more to be here is uh, as acceleration increases, the time taken to attain maximum pore pressure ratio got decreased for both treated and as well as untreated sand deposits. So uh, it is to be noted here uh, the time taken for uh, generation of excess pore water pressure was significantly reduced as well as it is delayed due to the provision of prefabricated vertical drain system. It is mainly because of the drainage path provided by PVD improvement system as it uh, delays the generation of excess pore water pressure and also it fastens the uh, dissipation of excess pore water pressure. So uh, the similar pattern has been observed in for both 40% and 60% RD as well. So uh, here we like to mention that the provision of drainage layer has created the difference in the generation of uh, excess pore water pressure. Coming to the maximum uh, density absorbed, uh, the density as mentioned earlier was uh, obtained due, uh, using the digital static bone penetrometer apparatus uh, conducted at random locations. From here, it is uh, mentioned that uh, in order to drainage mechanism, densification mechanism also plays a major role in mitigating the liquefaction resistance. Uh, a significant improvement in sand density was observed due to the installation of PVD, uh, PVD system and also uh, during the successive seismic events, both untreated as well as treated deposits as an increase in sand density due to the occurrence of re liquefaction phenomena and pre-shaking. So uh, from here we uh, observe that both combined densification and drainage mechanism are both important in mitigating the liquefaction that is when subjected to uh, repeated shaking events. Coming to the conclusions, uh, for any ground which is subjected to repeated shaking events, which, uh, uh, the provision of ground improvement technique is mandatory. 
that were in such a case in incremental pattern like what observed in during the 2011 uh, Japan earthquake or 2010-11 Canterbury earthquake series, such ground improvement techniques need to be adopted. Uh, in our present study, we have uh, adopted PVD improvement system as we have uh, observed that it works on both drainage mechanism and densification mechanism. Even under successive repeated shaking, uh, PVD improvement system was found good and it shows its stability and durability of uh, the system under repeated shaking events. So we conclude and recommend that uh, technique like prefabricated vertical drain system should, can be adopted to mitigate liquefaction as well as re-liquefaction during the successive seismic events as in because it works on both uh, densification and drainage mechanism which could be an apt technique to uh, to adopt and uh, to encounter the liquefaction under uh, high seismic intensities. With this, I like to conclude that PVD system has performed well under repeated shaking events. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Gautam, for a wonderful presentation on uh, the use of PVDs in the mitigation of liquef liquefaction hazards in multiple Thanks. shaking events. So, Srinivas, sir. Yes, any... nice presentation. Good. I mean, we had two presentations with alternative methods to actually handle the liquefaction problem by Ms. Smitha and uh, Ms. Gautam. They are good presentations. And, uh, Thank you, sir. Professor Anur, do you have any value addition? Uh, Gautam, it's a nice presentation. Um, Thank you, sir. I have seen people using PVD for... Uh, more like consolidation problem where you get um, searches load and consolidation occurs slowly. But when you apply this one for cyclic loading, like earthquake loading, uh, did you consider uh, the permeability of the soil? If water pressure develop and uh, water has to travel through the sand yes. to the PVD to come out, uh, did you consider that side? And what I see the improvement you observe it's a, maybe a combination of vertical drain as well as the uh, densification. Uh, if, if soil is dense, it tends to dilate during loading, so it, they reduce pore water pressure. So you may try to separate them to, uh, sure, to objectively see the improvement from that. Sure, sir. Sir, that would uh, be my suggestion. Thank you, sir. It is my part of my master's thesis work. Then uh, continuing it in my PhD research work, considering your. Uh, into a valuable suggestion. Sure, we'll be working on this in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think we did not have uh, any kind of questions in the chat box. Okay, uh, Gautam, I have a small Please, question. Please, sir. So, whether uh, anywhere this PVD is used in order to counter, you know, the liquefaction hazards that is caused by the multiple shake events, any shake sites events. in your knowledge? Sir, uh, in 2011, Japan has been. So there are observations of re liquefaction. Since then, the re liquefaction studies have been uh, started working. But uh, in that study, they have adopted sand compaction pile improvement system to mitigate the uh, future liquefaction and re liquefaction as of But as of now, uh, there is no uh, published work in PVD improvement system for uh, liquefaction or re liquefaction under multiple checking units. Uh, but what I understand, uh, it also the effectiveness. May also depends upon you know the time duration between the multiple events. Multiple events. Uh, because uh, we can have something after say for ten seconds because your graph shows the time to reach you know the maximum power water pressure some fifty seconds something yes, like that. So it also depends upon did you make an attempt to study means that the effectiveness uh, depending sure. upon you know the duration between the multiple events. Sure. Okay, uh, senior sir. No, fine. No, I think I uh, you propose a word of thanks and uh, group. Okay, sir. Please proceed for. Uh, let us conclude it. No, you okay. Okay. No, fine. You uh, no. Propose word of okay. Fine. And, uh, okay. Fantastic. Uh, so, we had a wonderful session. Really a wonderful session. Totally focusing on uh, the liquefaction phenomena. Under the various aspects, like for example, the probabilistic procedures, and we have got the two wonderful, uh, you know, uh, procedures like, for example, the use of the biopolymers and also the use of the PVDs in mitigating the liquefaction hazards. 
And uh, I would be really thankful to Professor uh, Mizanur Rahman for his very wonderful, valuable suggestions, which I think that will really add to the values of the present research work. So thanks a lot, sir, for uh, being Thank present you. right from the start to the end of this uh, presentation. And uh, thanks for your wonderful interaction with our research uh, students. Okay, uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Sir. So I think we can wind up, we can uh, close the session, am I right? Yes, sir. Okay, sir, fine. Thanks a lot.